Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, let's rest to our feet. Let's give God a great praise today. Come on, let's give him a great praise today. Come on, can we lift him? Come on, can we lift him? Can we lift him? Come on, we can do better than that. Come on, let's lift him. Hallelujah. Come on, can we lift him? Hallelujah, because he's the great I am. Because he's the lover of my soul. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hey! Amen. Well, while you're still on your feet, if you could just look to somebody to the left and right, come on, hug somebody next to you. Just say, it's good to see you this morning. Come on, hug somebody. Say, it's good to see you this morning. Come on, give them some love. Come on, encourage somebody today. Our responsibility is to encourage somebody. Come on, Angel, get on your feet, Angel. Cabri, on your feet, Cabri. Come on, find somebody, hug them. It's good to see you, Noni. Colleague, you got big arms. Let's go. Come on. Off your roll. Off your roll. Let's go. All right. Find somebody else. Come on. Let's go. Move. Let's move. Let's move. Love on somebody today. Encourage somebody today. Come on, find somebody else and encourage them. Let them know that you love them. Let them know that they're important. say gotta be where you are 
Come on, from your spirit, just say, I want to be where you are. Come on, I got to be, got to be where you are. Come on, say it like you love them. Say, I want to be where you are. Jesus, I want to be where you are. Y'all sound real good. I've got to be. I've got to be where you are. I want to be. I want to be. want to be where you are. Come on, as I'm doing this fast, I've got to be. I've got to be where you are. Regardless of how my flesh, I want to be. No matter what's happening in my life, I gotta be, gotta be where you are. Come on, from your heart, one more time. I wanna be, I wanna be where you are. I've gotta be, I gotta, gotta be where you are. Come on, put those hands together one more time. <laughs> For your glory. So I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> Don't hype me, because I will do it. Come on, come on. Everybody said amen but you. You're supposed to be my road dog. <laughs> like, sit down. All right. All right. Just a few announcements. Uh, after service, again, we'll be selling uh, fresh vegetables for you. Uh, Richard, if you could. Um, I don't know who had greens uh, last week. I don't know how it turned out for you. But for our house, those greens turned out to be amazing, right? And so um, we had so much in the bag that I think our greens lasted probably three days. Um, and it was just amazing. I'm going to tell you how God worked. I think there was some type of ingredients that Danny had told Lady Jazz to put in it. And I guess the seasoning she put in it failed too much in it. But I'm going to tell you how God works that thing out. You hear me? It was perfect. I was like, you need to mess up like that all the time. <laughs> right? And so what is, <laughs> what is so interesting is that in the process of uh, eating these greens, I kept just saying, good God. I'm, and I said, I'm going to call these glory greens. <laughs> now I know where the term came from. Right? So I, I look at these. This is, these are natural. This ain't got no chemicals, no pesticides. Right? But we need to start thinking about having, and we'll give some of these out for those who desire to have it after service. Uh, this is important that we continue the process, even after the journey uh, of fasting has come to an end uh, this month. I think it's still important that we start incorporating into our diet more vegetables and making more healthier choices. Uh, because if the truth be told, no one is responsible for your health but you. <clears throat> and those who sell products, they don't care about your health, they care about your money, right? And so we need to be very conscious of doing the things that matter, that fuel our bodies, right? And so it's going to be hard, but I think we're in a great place and we're starting off in a year where we're learning to detach ourselves that the governing choice about what I eat should not be off of taste. We've, all of our lives, we've made choices about what I'm going to eat based upon what it tastes like, right? So we're, we want to try to get to that place where we kind of grow or evolve from that. That taste is important, but it is not the predominating factor when it, when it comes to my precious organs, like my, my lungs and my kidneys and my intestines and my liver. These things matter, right? So you want to have great taste for something, and then it starts taking... Uh, moments of your life away, or you want to be able to eat right and do what God has called you to do so you can live out your purpose, right? So those things really matter. So I want to encourage us to, uh, when our farmer gets here uh, at the end of service, please take advantage of uh, having those produce. And again, the produce is going to be cheaper than what it is in the grocery stores, but more importantly, we're supporting an African-owned um, farm. Uh, again, that was on the same land with Harriet Tubman, but it was also important to make sure I'm making an investment into my own health. Right? 
Amen. I'm making an investment into my own health. And so consequently, my body will respond differently as I'm being consistent in eating more vegetables, right? So my energy levels have shot up as a result of not having all that stuff that weighs my body down and being sluggish. And so normally I would eat some food. I would feel uh, tired after I ate. Now I eat and I'm like, mm, I'm still hungry because I'm eating vegetables, right? So I still have to train myself to not overeat. So the whole goal is also to eat to satisfy hunger, not eat till you get full. Amen, Amen saints, Amen. right? So we have to learn how to detach ourselves from trying to eat till we get stuffed and miserable and sleepy, right? And trying to embrace itis, but rather I'm trying to learn how to just satisfy my hunger, right? By fueling it with the appropriate things. Also, I wanted to just get give you a heads up. Um, starting in February, the first Saturday of February, right? We'll be having our workout uh, class, which will start at 10 o'clock, just for 59 minutes where we're getting in and we're burning some calories, right? We're getting our bodies moving. We're trying to create elasticity with our muscles and our tendons and our ligaments. Some of us haven't stretched in a long time, right? So there'll be a process where you'll do a warm up, right? You'll be taught how to appropriately stretch, right? Uh, and so some of us are tight because we haven't stretched in a long time. So those type of things really matter. Uh, you'll realize that if you're doing some good stretching, you'll be breaking out a good sweat before you even get to the workout. Yeah. Hear me, hear me. That's when you know you're stretching good when you start breaking a sweat just to stretch, right? So we'll be doing that starting the first Saturday in February, February the 2nd, starting at 10 o'clock. So we have two amazing, energetic, bouncing off the wall instructors we'll have. Uh, Kiana, a.k.a. Boot, uh, Rand will be doing it at Boot, right? Right. So she will, we'll call her Bootsy, right? So she'll be, she will be leading along with Stephanie, the birthday girl. Capricorn season will be in full effect. Uh, leading us and those two, uh, we're in great hands in terms of, and purchase your, and she says, get your yoga mat, make sure if you're interested, for those four to six weeks, make sure that you're getting a yoga mat so that you can be prepared uh, for the moment. You don't need to bring any weights. We got enough weight around here to do what we need to do. We'll use our own body weight, right? Yeah, some of our arms are already equipped, feel like dumbbells on it already, right? And so we'll use our own body weight uh, to kind of help us, all right? Also on February, the second February, sorry, second Saturday, in February, February the 10th, we'll have a church meeting where I just want to kind of share some things in terms of where we're going, in terms of direction, so that you guys are clear where we are, where we're going, what we're endeavoring to do in this calendar year, and some milestones that we have to tackle, and some benchmarks that we need to reach so that we can really posture ourselves to be effective in terms of ministry. And then we'll hear some very exciting things in terms of some things, some ministry opportunities that people can kind of plug into and to start getting active, all right? With that said, let's go ahead and go to the table of contents. Let's get our Bibles, personal devices. Let's look up Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17, and we'll just take a look at, well, for context, I'll read verses uh, 14 all the way to 21. But our emphasis is just verse 21, but I want it for context I uh, just want to make sure that we are on the same page. That's all right. I love mute, mood music as we're reading Holy Scripture together. Not a problem. All right. Matthew chapter 17, starting with verse 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, for he is an epileptic who suffers severely. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. And so they brought him to his disciples, but your disciples could not cure him. And then Jesus said, oh, faithless and perverse generation, generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And then Jesus rebuked the demon and he came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and they said to him, why could we not cast it out? 
Jesus said to him, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible yeah, for you. Yeah. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Amen. 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 So we want to, you may be seated, we want to finish sharing from... Uh, the series of gut instincts, gut instincts. So whenever we're talking about the mechanism or the process by which we are driven in terms of making decisions, uh, it is intuitive for us to immediately start making decisions based upon how we feel. And it has been said over a period of time that whenever making the best decisions, some of the world's advice have been, whenever making the best decisions for yourself, when you're getting ready to be confronted with something that requires a choice, the best thing to do is to lean on your gut or go with your gut instinct. Oftentimes, we have discovered that going with our gut instinct is very limited and is sometimes incorrect. We have put so much trust in our gut in that we have allowed ourselves to lean in on not so much information, but rather how I feel in the moment that I'm confronted with the choice. So I am making commitments or allowing myself to go in covenant or choosing to release, give, or to do something based upon a feeling that resides in my gut. And I'm making long-term commitments and decisions based upon short-term information. So this puts me in a very precarious situation because whatever I decide that emanates from my gut, I have to live whatever choice that I have made. And that is not God's will for me to go through life choosing and committing and going into covenant based upon how I feel in my gut. That's a bad place to be. But oftentimes we have done that. When I can't choose between two options or three options or four options, rather than looking at how does this benefit me in a spiritual realm, I am really going with how do I feel about the choices. And in moments of split seconds, I'm making a decision based upon how I see the benefits being extended to me. Gut decisions. Gut instinct. What do you think? What does your gut tell you? Should I commit to this? What does your gut tell you? Should I go there? What does your gut tell you? And this is not based from a spiritual disposition, but it is based upon how much intellect, how much information, how much exposure I have based upon the choices that is extended to me. So I am making a decision with limited information only from my knowledge base. And I'm going with a feeling and my limited and capped intellect rather than give me a moment to pray about it. Give me a moment to be led. Give me a moment to consult God and to get clarity from God on what I should do next. I'm going to go ahead and make this decision based upon how I feel in this moment. And how I feel in this moment may not be accurate. The way that I feel is really driven sometimes based upon external circumstances that has a play in how I'm feeling internally. So if I'm presented with the same choices on day one as day two, my feelings are going to be totally different and my choices are going to be different. So if I am confronted with an option to choose between A and B on day one, if everything has been going well for me in that day, if everybody is being nice to me on that day, if everything is going in my favor yeah. on that day, yeah. then I'm more likely to choose one way. Yeah. Now, on day two, if I haven't made a decision from day one, on day two, if people had gotten on my nerves, people are cutting me off in traffic, I burnt my outfit or burnt my blouse when I was trying to iron it, or it seems like there's no more toothpaste in the toothpaste tube, yeah. and then all of a sudden, I, I get out there and my tie look like it's flat, or the little light came up on my dashboard in the car, or I realize I got to stop and it's raining, I don't want to stop for gas, I ain't got no umbrella today, my hair's starting to frizz up, I didn't do the touch up on my perm, I'm doing all of this stuff, and now I have to make a choice. My choice will be different. 
And where is it going to come from? My gut. So when we look at every facet of our lives, when choices matter, choices matter, what you decide is pivotal as it relates to the things of your life. And you're making life decisions based upon your gut. That's why all of us have excess because we made decisions out of our gut. Very few have a first love and stay with the same love. Many of us got a resume of lovers because I went off of my gut. Mm. Many of us have a resume full of different jobs because I chose off of gut. I submitted it off of gut. Many of us have been connected to different churches off of a gut decision. When I showed up, the choir was killing it that day. I showed up, the pastor was preaching that day. Or when I went there, that was the first church that people acknowledged me and they said hi and they let me just sit in the back and they ain't make me stand up and say my name, what church and what affiliation and what I was supposed to do. They didn't let me do it. I have a good gut feeling about this. Uh, In every arena, we are making decisions off of gut. Every August, we get excited, don't we, Channing, about football. In every year, You know where I'm going with this. Whether it was a Redskins fan or whether you was a Commanders fan or when you was just team, whatever your title was, every August, they got a gut instinct. They're going all the way. Every, every year, every year. And it has been like that for the past 23 years. They got a gut instinct. They never have a gut instinct that this is going to be another failure season as it has been previous year, decade after decade. I'll spend my money. I'll show up. I'll get paraphernalia. You change the name. I got that too. And I'm still going to have this gut instinct. We going all the way. Mm -hmm. Last week they played Dallas Cowboys. All leading up the week. They had a gut instinct with the last game of the season. We going to win this one. Let me just say this to you. Let me just let me just say this. This is a commercial break. This ain't got nothing to do with the mess, but I just this has been on my heart to say this. For all the single ladies out there who watching online. You looking for a good loyal man, you ought to find a, a Commanders fan cuz I tell you No matter how bad your life is, he'll never walk away. He'll never leave you. He'll show up. He'll spend money. That's the kind of person you want. All the single ladies looking for a good man. You can find one at FedEx. Don't got to have no vision, boo-boo. Just be there. He will show up. Don't have to have a winner's mentality. Just show up. That's all I'm going to say about the commanders this year. That's, ain't nothing else left to say, really. I think that's it. That's, that's nothing else to say about them this year. But next year. But next year, his gut. See, his gut tells him next year. Yeah. Yeah, y'all should have been there and beyond because y'all keep saying all the way every year. How how much of a way y'all? Never mind. Jesus says, "I am the way." (laughs) Yeah, but we make decisions off of our our gut, and it has gotten us in a tremendous amount of. Challenges, suffering and headaches, and afflictions. You know, when it comes to maturing in life, we never deviated from that pattern. We grew into into our adulthood still making decisions based upon feelings, right? And so now that we have given our life over to Christ, now we're taught, from a scriptural perspective, that I don't make choices from feelings. 
but they must be driven by faith in God. And that becomes taboo because that wrecks the whole system of how we have designed the mechanism of the process by which we think and how we make choices. So now I need to be prayerful about it. Now I need to fast about it. Now I need to bring it before God and wait for a decision. That's counterintuitive for me. Right. And so now when you see this going into a personal thriving relationship with Christ, that now I don't make decisions based upon a feeling or my gut instinct. But now I need to make decisions in accordance to what does the face of God tell me when I've laid before him. So when you get to Matthew 17, when it comes to doing ministry on a whole nother level, the idea is that I have been prepared for ministry that I have been in a place where I have sanctified myself, that I've been in a place where I have been made ready for ministry to serve others at a higher capacity. Well, when Jesus sends the disciples out to do ministry, they discover that it is not what they thought it would be. They had discovered that I can't go into the disposition of serving and being there for people and helping others doing it based upon a gut feeling. When they go out to serve, they're running across individuals who got some very serious issues and challenges. And they're trying to do ministry out of their flesh. They're trying to do it out of a way that makes sense to them. I'm going to serve on a level that makes sense. I'll give on a level that I think makes sense. I'll deal with, with all kind of challenges in a way that makes sense to me. And not based upon faith, but I'll do it out of my own flesh. So when they go to serve, they come across somebody who's an epileptic who is also being tormented by a demon. And they tell him, listen, my child, the, this individual here, every time he has his moments of seizure, he also jumps into the fire that we have set up there and he tries to kill himself and burn himself alive. We try to restrain him. We try to hold him down, but nothing seems to help. We constrain him. We put him off on the other side where people can't be around him. So he's not disruptive or being a challenge to other people. Can you please do something about him? It is my understanding that you guys function as the disciples of Jesus of Nazareth. And because we've heard about his power, we've heard about his exploits, we heard about supernatural activity and miracles coming from him as his disciples. It is my understanding that you are students and learners of Christ. So then maybe whatever he has taught you, you can implement minute and work it out here in my child well when they get there they're looking at them they're praying over them, and nothing seems to happen they're working out of their flesh they're doing all kind of stuff and ain't nothing working so finally he's able to approach jesus he says listen my child has this issue this is what we're dealing with i brought him to the ones you've been pouring into I brought them to the ones you've been talking to. The ones that you spend time with mentoring and coaching and teaching and discipling. The ones who spent their lives with you over these past three years. These individuals, I've been sharing with them what the challenges are and they look and ain't nothing working. They pray, but I don't see any difference. Look at him. He's still having challenges now. Jesus says, how long do I need to be with you guys? And how long are you going to act like you're faithless? You faithless and perverse generation. Then he casts out the demon of the individual. And then he shares with them, listen, this stuff only comes by you operating in a level of faith. With your level of faith, you only just need the size of a mustard seed. You only need to operate in the, in the level of confidence and believing in God this much. Can you not trust God this much? When you're dealing with opposition, when you're dealing with challenges, when you seem like something is insurmountable before you, you can't trust God at this level. He uses an analogy of dealing with something that is the smallest seed. You mean you can't trust God a little bit? And even having enough trust and confidence in God, just a little bit, is enough to get God to rearrange the atmosphere and to cause a mountain that you see to be moved out of your way. If you have this much confidence in God, now when it comes to your own life, if you can just operate on that level further, however far be it then, that this kind only comes by prayer and fasting. So you want to be able to operate and move at a level where you see the supernatural power of God? You're going to have to not only turn your plate over, but you're going to also have to turn your face down as well in prayer. And it is not just saying no to food. It is also saying no to you. 
So fasting is not, it's not just isolated to you not having meat, not having chicken, not having fish, or not having your sweets, or all your pleasures that you like to put on the spoon. It is really also about you taking the posture of your heart and consecrating it before God, learning how to say no to you. That's what really fasting is really about. But we've been so consumed about what I'm going to put on my fork and my spoon that I'm missing the moments that God is really trying to get my attention. You want power, but you ain't got enough power to say no to your fork. And you wonder why the dynamics of my life is still the same from day one of the fast to day 22. Because the real power is learning how to have self-denial and tell your flesh no. And giving it over to God. So then, as we're writing, my heart's posture should be consecrate yourself. My heart's posture should be consecrate yourself. Not how long is this fast going to be, how many days I got left, and what can I eat at 601. My heart's posture should be consecrate yourself. That's my heart's posture, to consecrate yourself. Not concentrate on yourself. Mm. Come on. Because now the emphasis in fasting is not consecrate, but concentrate. I keep thinking about all day. All I think about all day is what I'm going to eat when I get to 601. Oh, my goodness. What I'm going to eat. And this is every day. I, I spend more energy, more time. My thought process, my thought process is really driven around how am I going to feed my flesh? How am I going to give my flesh some level of satisfaction in the course of these 12 hours? Now, here again, our fasting is modified. Our fasting is modified. We're not fasting 24 hours. It's 12 hours. Three hours in, you act like you're starving. The body can go, a healthy body can go up to three weeks, healthy body, can go three weeks without food. You go three hours in by 11 or 12 o'clock, you're having issues tomorrow, I can't do this, I'm starving. I'm, 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 I'm about to die up in here. This is ridiculous. Woo, I'm sweating. You're going through all these changes and it only been three or four hours. And for some of you who telework, you've been trying to nap through the day so that I can knock off some of your fast. I ain't crazy. I got flesh too. I know how this works. You're trying to nap your way through consecration. So by the time I wake up, I only got like three or four hours left. Then to be ready, be more time for me to eat. And maybe I can do that. You're trying to figure out all the ways that you can get out of consecrating yourself and having self-denial. The power is released when you can make this process not about you. The issue that the disciples is having is that they try to do ministry and still serve without consecrating themselves. And you cannot qualify for that level of power if you're not willing to surrender to the power. To be able to walk in that level of power shows God I can be trusted with operating in the true riches of God. Which means... I am not consumed throughout my day for just 12 hours thinking about how I'm going to give my flesh what it wants. What is the workaround? Can I have this? Can I have that? What about this? What about this? I didn't think about this, but how about this? Is this, is this doable? Is this permissible? Is this allowed? Should we avoid this? Should I have this? Can I taste this? Is this what? How does this fall on the list? And we're looking at all these things and we're looking stuff up and we Google it and we YouTube it all over trying to figure out what can I eat? When can I eat it? And how much can I have? Which is too much? Or does it fall into a sin? Because even then I need to be conscious that when I can eat, if I overeat, I just sinned all over again because I became a glutton. Yeah. So here again, the whole purpose is not to eat till I get full, but to satisfy my hunger, just to fuel my body. So then when it's come 601, it is time for you to eat. You don't have three, four, five bowls of whatever you ate. Now you've entered in the realm of overindulging. Now you became greedy and now you will hit the realm of sin. So yeah, yeah, somebody just exhaled. I heard that. Because now the mindset is, I need to really posture myself in giving myself over to God. And I only need what is necessary. 
And in a culture that wants you to have overabundance of everything, we generally pack our plates. We're eating with our eyes and not our stomachs. We're eating from the disposition of how it looks in our flesh. Ooh, I need that. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. I want all of that. And I'm overindulging when I only just need a little bit to sustain me. So the idea is that I'm consecrating myself. My heart needs to be consecrated before God, not concentrate on myself. So if you become the center focus and you're constantly thinking about you, thinking about what you can get out of it, what you can receive from this, you're making the process about you. The whole idea of fasting is to really align myself to the power of God and God's heart and God's will. That's what fasting is really about. It's dying to myself so that I can allow him to live through me. It is the process of me saying, God, what is on your heart in this moment? And that needs to be my focus. That needs to be what my heart needs to be centered on, whatever you're saying, whatever you're thinking. But it is hard when you're constantly using your time and your energy to kind of figure out what menu you're going to come up with that you can't get tired of later. I'm going to eat this. Let me see. I'm going to do this. What am I eat? But if I do that today, what am I eat tomorrow? And you're consumed. You're consumed with trying to satisfy your flesh. Now that's eating. How does that play out in the other characteristics of your life? Wow. See, fasting gives you an opportunity to see how driven you are by your flesh. It shows you how consumed you are with allowing your flesh to have its way. And just how you try to figure out what you can and cannot eat, what is permitted and what is not permissible, you do the same thing with character. How far can I take my flesh without it disappointing God? I remember when we were doing, when we were doing a team, me and Elder Keisha used to do team Bible study. We were doing team ministry years ago. And that was the most... Most draining uh, part is the questions that teens ask, because the, the questions that teens used to always ask is, how far can they go and sin without disappointing God? And it's just like it'd be one after, they'd be rapid fire, bro. It just, it's one after the other. They ask stuff like, okay, I know we can't, I know the Bible said we can't have sex though, but is it wrong to tongue kiss? They'd be like, Elder, 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 Elder Keisha, is it, is it inappropriate? The Bible don't say anything about masturbation directly. Is that wrong to masturbate? Elder Keisha be like, okay, uh, Taye, you want to take this one? <laughs> As are all kind of stuff. How far can I go without disappointing God? Look how that plays out in adulthood. Can I, dri- can I drizzle caramel on my, on my fruit when I'm eating it, pastor? You know, we're, we're looking for ways to give our flesh what it wants, but without crossing the line. Looking for loopholes in consecration. Because we're inevitably in this fasting process, my energy is really driven to how much can I still have my flesh have its way, but yet also still try to reap benefits from God as if I'm doing it all the way? Right? And so that becomes the problem where I have to really divorce myself from the process and not try to find doors and exits or loopholes or things that can kind of come alongside of it just so that I can still give my flesh some level of relief. It's going to involve suffering. That ain't real suffering, but it's still going to probably feel like it. Because really, if the truth be told, those who are in third world countries, they're forced. Not because they picky, but in their certain regions that their food is scarce. There is still famine in certain parts of the region of the globe. And they've gone days. You get four hours, you're losing your mind. We say, take away coffee. For 21 days. I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't even do my work. I can't think my head be pounding. Because you're addicted to it. That's why. 
Breaking any addiction is hard. That it gets to the point. This is when you know you have wrecked the system of your temple. When you say, I can't do, I ain't clocking in. I ain't turning on a computer. I ain't checking these voicemails. I ain't talking to my co-workers until I have my cup of coffee. Jesus. Two creams, two sugars. If this is how you start your day, you have wrecked your body already. That's just beverage. That's beverage. Again, that's a that's a beverage. Beverage. We're not even talking about what you also gonna put in to sustain and to fuel your body. I had my coffee, I had my bagel, carbohydrates, pure sugar. Body is being fueled off of sugar. Yet you think you're supposed to be thinking clearly and operate at your optimum pace and capacity? You a walking vending machine full of snacks, beverages. That's funny, but some people are absolutely mad. Why he going there? That's not even that. That's not even, that ain't, that ain't got nothing to do with this scripture text. That ain't got nothing to even do with fast. But the point I'm making is that we have to take a different look at how we treat this temple. Let me just remind you what Paul says. For those who say, listen, you know what? This is my body. I do whatever I want. Scripture would say in 1 Corinthians, right? What? Did you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body and spirit, which belongs to him. You don't own the vessel that you live in. You are steward of it. You are living in something that God has already extended to you, but you don't own it. You dress it up. You you put all this other apparel on it, this attire, but it is not yours. So then what I'm doing in this fasting process, I'm representing the God who I am. And I am dying to my flesh in this process. But you again, you get to see how, how your flesh operates up close when you have to tell your flesh no. Now, when it comes to infants, right? When they are in a space, in a lane where they are growing, maturing, whenever they're hungry, as soon as they feel the sensation of hunger, they go through temper tantrums. They cry, they kick, they whine until you put a bottle in their mouth. Then they satisfy Right. The same thing happens unless I give my flesh with it once and I go into an adulthood with that same premise. Unless I give my flesh with it once, I'll kick and scream. I have an attitude or someone say I am hangry. The Snickers commercial makes a lot of sense. You see somebody acting all nasty and mean and cantankerous. They're like, yeah, man, take a Snickers. They're like, I needed that. Thank you. Right. And the same thing happens with us because I haven't stuffed my mouth with a sweet or a treat or a snack. That means I have the the freedom or I should feel free of being nasty and curt and mean to people so that my flesh don't get its way, then it impacts my character. My flesh don't get its way, then it impacts my conduct. My flesh doesn't get what it wants, then it consumes my conversation. So because I don't get my flesh what it wants, when my flesh cannot receive what it longs for, desires for, when I don't get the desired outcome of my flesh, even you're going to see it reflected in my conversation. I'll cuss you out or I'll be nasty or you'll see it in my conduct, how I act, disposition. I'm all, my body language is different because my flesh is not getting what it's want in any context. So fasting helps to bring you to a place that you start seeing how messy you are. How jacked up you are. And if turning a fork down and putting a spoon away is difficult for 12 hours, imagine how you are in your flesh for 24 hours. So food is not the emphasis. It's really your flesh. It's really showing you you. But your emphasis is because someone is taking it's because something is being taken away. The more it's taken away, the more I want it. Mm-hmm. We know that, right? And Richard saying we we always been like that. But we we and that's and that's in every arena. It's in every arena, in any and every arena. 
parents in here, as your kids mature and get older, you start cleaning up toys, removing toys, throwing away toys. What happens? They have an offense. Oh, oh, don't throw that away. That's my toy. Don't do that. That's my toy. You ain't played with this. I know, but it's, I want it. Yeah. You going to play with it? Yeah. And they don't. I just want it. So that when I want to go after it, I have it available. It don't have my attention. I just, I just don't want you to give it away, and I just want it whenever I need it. That's as a kid. That's the toys. But let's talk about when men grow up still want their toys. I don't want you, but I don't want you to leave either. Wow. Come on, yeah. We're on wrong street. Let me buckle you turn. So when we start talking about clothes, ladies, you got stuff in your closet that you won't wear, but you won't release. Come on, get rid of that. Somebody else can wear that. Uh-uh, I might have an event I might go to and wear that. You know you're not going to wear that. Okay, there's no streets that we can go on today. Let's just get back, back to this. So Jesus is really pushing the point that as you're trying to do ministry on a whole nother level, you really need to be sensitive have you been trying to operate through ministry and life consecrating yourself? You cannot just try to consecrate yourself right before you get into a challenge. It's there. By the time you recognize you're in a challenge, it's there. You can't fast. I need to go in an emergency fast. Ah, I just found out some bad news. So what, you going to try to wait 21 days and wait that out? Now in our house, we go through emergency fast all the time. They want something. We out. Don't I say that? We out and about. Oh, can we stop at McDonald's? Nope, we're on emergency fast. We're not eating. Sometimes you just gotta, you gotta go with your gut on that and say, no, 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 no. We're on emergency fast today. We're not, we're not getting that. We're not getting that. Try it. It works. It works. They don't fight you when you say that. They don't, they don't say much. They're like, oh my goodness. Yeah, you just got to call it an emergency fast, right? <laughs> yeah. Here's something else to consider. <clears throat> As they're doing ministry, they're at a place, because Jesus makes this emphasis, when you're dealing with demonic activity, when you're dealing with opposition, when you're dealing with the spirit of darkness, and you're confronted by it, you can't come half cocky, you can't come in your flesh. And so it's not just about you praying, but you also have to be in a place where you have consecrated yourself that you've received power from God to be able to deal with certain oppositions. And so if you have an inconsistent prayer life and there is no existence of consecration and putting your flesh to the side, then you're not going to be able to deal with demonic activity in your own flesh. You're not going to get the results. So then now as we're dealing with our own challenges, with our own issues, our own setbacks, our own afflictions, when we're dealing with things that are strongholds and we need chains broken in our life and we need addictions dismantled and bad habits and patterns that are destructive in our life. If you have a shoddy prayer life and there is absolutely no consecration, how are you going to deal with that? Then furthermore, right, we need to start looking at, as we talk about dealing with consecration and fasting, Right? What is your motivation for this? What is your motivation motivation for fasting? Right? So when, when James when, when James writes to the church, he mentions that when it comes to your prayer life, some things you're praying for, you're not getting it because you're asking amiss. You're asking with the wrong intent or wrong motive. Your heart is not in the right place for what you're asking for. So then when we start looking at what am I fasting for, what are you seeking to gain or to get from the fast? Are you the sole benefactor? of it because when you look at the process of fasting in the old testament in scripture right old testament opens up with them trying to receive information and instruction from god then you see him that god would give when they would fast the people would receive victories from god when the enemy would come it ain't just for me it's for the whole body it's for the whole nation furthermore when they have found themselves in a place where they've strayed away from from god from so much and they're caught up in all type of debauchery and bad patterns and sinful dispositions, the whole nation would go into a fast to break patterns and to show God, I am repentant. 
Furthermore, when you're talking about looking at the gifts of the Spirit and being able to hear from God and have some level of discernment or to hear from the prophetic or to have God speak or to download into you, fasting. It ain't just so that you can qualify to get a house. It's not so that you can get more stuff. This is to deal with things on a spiritual level, not stuff that you can acquire or buy with money. This is on a whole deeper level. And so some of our motivations are skewed. And if let's be honest, this is not all of us, but there's a few of us in here and I'm going to step on your pinky. Some of us look forward to the fast to reset our bodies so that they, we can deal with the weight issue. The weight issue. My motivation for these 21 days, Trey, is to deal with the weight issue. There's two of them that is in, that's in play. One are looking forward to deal with the weight, where God has said, I'm trying to help you deal with your weight. Two different W's, two different weights. There's a weight issue, right? So when you look at Daniel in his moments of having these extreme challenges, in the context of which Daniel was living in, he prayed and he fasted. Finally, the angel shows up 21 days at the end of his fast. And the angel says, I, God had heard your prayer on day one. But I had to be, I was wrestling with a demonic spirit, an angel up there that was trying to keep us from getting here to bring you the answer. And we had, I had to wait for another angel to come and fight them all to release me to come down here to give you God's answer to your prayer. But for them 21 days, he had to deal with the weight. Not this, not this, not your calories, right? Not your waist size, but dealing with the weight issue. And so fasting helps you to deal with this weight because God is dealing with some things in the background in eternity on the other side of the curtain of your life, making sure that some things are flowing into your life the way that it needs to be. But best believe that there is demonic opposition to what you've been praying for. And thank God for Daniel's situation of why he had to wait for us to discover that when I don't get my prayers answered, there is a demonic entity trying to hold up the answer from God. And how I handle the wait period is pretty critical. He did it on day one, praying and fasting, and he didn't receive the answer immediately, but the answer was already released from heaven. But he kept the process going. There was a level of consistency, and he was committed to the process, even though I haven't got the answer yet. So can you be consistent and committed to the process as you're waiting for God to give you the answer, but it ain't showed up yet? Can you put your flesh in check as you're waiting? Can you control yourself from cussing somebody out while you're in this process of consecration? Can you pull your flesh together and say, you will honor God. Even though I don't feel like it, I will bless the Lord. Not when I feel like it, but at all times. His praise will continuously be in my mouth. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God. Can you be consistent even as you're waiting for the results? So what's your motivation? Right? What's your motivation? Right? So write this down and we'll, we'll go because we're out of time. If the consecration period, if this consecration period is going to be worth anything, I have to die to my flesh. I have to die to my flesh. If this consecration period is going to be worth anything, I have to die to my flesh. So then, the consecration is not just the flipping of the plate, right? It's a flipping of my spiritual disposition. So my conduct has got to change. My character needs to be modified. And my conversation needs to be different. My conduct needs to change. My character needs to be modified. And my conversation needs to change, right? Which means, 
Can't just say anything that my flesh feel like saying. Alondra at the door, you ought to be saying amen, Alondra. You can't say everything your flesh feel like saying. You hear me, Jeanette? You can't just say whatever your flesh feel like saying. You hear me, Trevor? You can't say whatever your flesh feel like saying. We're in a process of consecration. What's the purpose of you turning your plate down to receive power from God, but you cuss people out when you are able to eat? I, I ain't eat right now. I'm, I'm fasting. Mother, you know, you going off on somebody. You're going you gonna to cuss somebody out. You're going to continuously be like that. You might as well eat. Eat. You're going to act like that. Just eat. Because you might be more holy with a full belly than it is hungry. Just eat. Be done with it. Just eat. Me and somebody else got a joke in here already. They're like, 2024, that's a wrap. I'll start over 2025. I'm done. Forget it. Ain't no time. I'm done. I don't cuss people out already. I'm done. That's it. You might as well just eat. You're going to do all that? If you're going to be doing what you've been doing, ain't no point of you fasting. Because the consecration is not just abstaining from food. It is the dying of the flesh. And without the consecration component within this spiritual discipline, it is nothing more than a sophisticated diet. That's it. That's it. And the best that you're going to get out of it is weight loss. No power. No deliverance. No release from strongholds. Your waist is thinner, but your problems got bigger. Jesus. If you're going to do all that, you ain't going to consecrate yourself. Just eat. Just eat. Who's going to do it? Because you're just sitting there wasting your time. You're just making yourself hungry and you're nasty to everybody. If you ain't going to check your conversation, you ain't going to check your character and let the character of Christ arise in you, and you're not going to deal with your conduct, just eat. Because all you're doing is having a temper tantrum like a baby waiting on a bottle. And all you're doing is make people rush up to you to put something in your mouth so you shut up. What, what is, where's the bottle? Where's the bottle? Where, come on, where, let's go. Let's go. Come on, come on, they cry. Come on. It's okay. It's okay. And this is what they do. It's going to be all right. You don't got to be mad. Why you got to be like that? That's, that's the same that they do with their babies. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's coming. Where you at? This is okay, uh -huh. sir. And that's exactly what we have to do. We go into an adulthood doing the same thing, having temper tantrums, and everyone is pacifying you, and everyone is coddling you because your flesh is having an upset moment. <clears throat> Why are they going up like now going to adulthood. Why are they acting like that? They just going through some stuff right now. So we go into the same, still making excuses, yeah. still looking for coddling. Yeah. So then, I need to be sensitive about my conduct, conversation, and my character. <clears throat> Which means I need to pull away from certain things as we're wrapping up. I know I said it before, but I'm saying it now and I mean it. As, as we're looking to consecrate our character, we got to consecrate our character, we got to pull away from certain things, which means then some of my pleasures need to, in addition to my body, needs to be put on the altar. Some of my pleasures as well. Paul is really clear. Now, this is, oh, this is hard. Here we go. <clears throat> if it's, this is going to be hard for both, whatever category you in, whether you're a sinner or a saint, this is a hard one. When it comes to affection and intimacy, right? The consecration period, that's the only period that I'm really free from, from my due benevolence. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I, got, I got other people here like Trey and, and Kamina. I hope you get what I'm saying. If you don't understand what I'm saying, you ask me later. I'll explain it to you differently. Right? So husbands and wives are supposed to render due benevolence. Right? Due benevolence. <laughs> but I'm free from the responsibility only in the process of fasting because I'm supposed to be consecrating myself. Because again, I'm removing the pleasures from it. Right? I'm supposed to be... So then, so in any area that creates or stimulates pleasure to my flesh, I'm supposed to revisit it, reevaluate, is it beneficial for my spiritual walk and remove it through my period of consecration. Which means, we're writing this down. It's the last thing I'm going to tell you to write. If it distracts, it subtracts. If it distracts, it subtracts. If it is distracting me, 
If it fills my space during this moment of consecration, then it is taking away from me as well. It is taking something away from me. If it distracts, it subtracts. So then the social media viewership should decline. My TV time, my Netflix and my Apple TV time should decrease, right? Because the time is supposed to be filled with me trying to get more of God. I am moving the food out so that I can have more of God, more of God, more of God, right? Because what I really, what I really need is not based upon what makes sense to me. It's really based upon what is identified in his will. So in our immaturity, we spend a lot of time creating prayers that ain't even on God's page. So as Ephesians would say, right, he is able, he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that I can ask. Or think. So whatever I am asking or thinking, God is already higher than that. So most of the time, my prayers are at a base level and below what God wanted to give me anyway. I'm asking for stuff for God on a kindergarten level. He's trying to give me stuff on a PhD level. That's how far the gap is between what I've been praying, slobbering, speaking in tongues over drooling, crying, weeping, wailing over in prayer. God is like, I got something much higher than that. You begging me for something that ain't even on my list. What's on my list, you ain't even thought of. What I wanted to do for you ain't even hit your mind yet. And you're lowering yourself only based upon what you've been exposed to. I've been trying to do stuff that ain't even hit your mind. Ain't nobody seen it before. But because you've seen it in somebody else, you begging me for that. I wanted to do something that was going to blow your mind. So fasting adjusts my heart to God's. So fasting and praying is not about me giving prayers to God and trying to manipulate the activity of God. Please do this because I've been praying for this. God said, you keep giving me these prayer requests. Ask me what I want to do. That's small time stuff you asking me. I'm trying to make you come up a level. Wow. Jesus. You asking me to get you out of this? I wanted to keep you in this so I can free everybody around you. He's doing bigger and better. Your prayers are too small. That's why scripture, Paul would say, we don't even know what to pray for when we do. We asking for the wrong stuff. But fasting and praying adjust my heart to God, whatever it is you want to do, my heart is being prepared for the okay. All his bowed. Father, we thank you for this period, this moment. To be reminded of the emphasis of what you want to do with us during this moment of consecration. This moment is set aside not to be presented as a wish list, but so that I can really become one with your heart. And ultimately, what you want to say from heaven trumps what I wanted to beg of you. Having clarity about what you desire, what you want to do on the earth, what you want to do in my life, helps me to adjust my heart to that. Fasting helps prepare my soul to come in alignment with the hard stuff that may not make sense to me. Fasting helps break down my feelings so that I can operate in faith. We don't want to live life being fearful. We want to be full of you. So help us to have the correct perspective as we approach the period of consecration. Need to deviate from just doing what felt right, what was in my gut, 
my instincts led me astray. If all we needed was gut instincts, you would have never gave us your Holy Spirit. You gave me your Holy Spirit because we would make too many bad choices with the instincts in our gut. The Holy Spirit is on the inside to lead and to guide into all truth. You've given your precious Holy Spirit to give me counsel, to instruct in wisdom, to convict me when I'm off course. And to be at a place that I am leaning in on gut instincts means I am leaning and, and living on my flesh. My decision-making process, as limited as it is, is driven out of my flesh, out of a soulish experience. But you're calling us to go higher and to go deeper and to go wider and further. And that only comes by way of surrendering to the Holy Spirit. In this moment, if you've never given your heart to God, you've never given your heart to Christ, you've never surrendered, but you desire to do that. He stands at the door and knocks. He is the door. He is the good shepherd. If you've never said yes to God, scripture is clear. That if you reject Christ, then those who reject Christ will find themselves in eternity in hell. Spiritual death. Separation from God. Separation from God. God is clear. He desires that no man should perish, but that all will come to repentance. It is not God's desire to send his creation to hell. But they have an opportunity to choose to receive him as Lord and Savior. All roads, all ways don't lead to God. Jesus says, behold, I am the way, the way, the truth and the life. No man goes to God but through me. Behold, he's the door. He's the door. He's the door. And if you have not gone through Jesus and received him as his son and received his lordship and his Savitic work at the cross, then you're not born again. You can be a good person. You can be very charitable. You can be just genuinely nice in your character. But if you're not born again, if you're not saved, then you will not experience eternal life. We know that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. Jesus says, I've come that you may have life until life is in overflow. Or King James Version says, life abundantly. And if you have not experienced the abundant life, if you are not in the arms of God, if you're not even quite sure if you're saved, we want to share with you, according to Scripture, how you can have eternal life. Not our opinion, not our doctrine, not our theology. According to God's holy word, how you can have eternal life. That is you. We want to pray with you. If you're not quite sure if you're born again, if you're not quite sure you're saved, but you want to have assurance as to whether or not you're saved, Holy Scripture can give you that assurance. Amen. Put those hands together. Let's just celebrate our salvation. Come on, let's thank God that we saved. Thank God that we're born again. Amen. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts now to respond to God through giving. And as we are clear and aware, That giving is an expression of worship. Giving is an expression of worship.
And when I give, I give with the right motive. I don't give to get. I don't give just to get a blessing back. I give, number one, because he commanded it, and number two, because I love him. And as a result of my obedience to what he has commanded, he's given us promises because we've practiced the principle that he would open up a window of heaven and pour out a blessing that we don't have the capacity to receive it. I give with the right intent. I want to honor God. That my giving is attached or is an extension of my worship before him. That's why I give. The tithe is what I present to God. As a good steward, I present back to God what is already his. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. He owns the cattle on a thousand hill. Everything that I have access to, it's God's. I present the tithe back. A tenth, as Leviticus would say, the tithe is holy unto the Lord. I present the holy thing back unto the Lord. This becomes my exercise of obedience. Then number two, I extend the offering. It is the gift that I sow. I don't sow it with the intent to get back as if it's a lottery system or an investment system. I sow into the kingdom because I love God and I love his people. But the spiritual principle is applied to my life. Whatsoever thou soweth, that's, that shall you also reap. You sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, thou shall reap bountifully. I sow with the intent to honor, with the intent to honor God. And as we have been saying, I don't give just in churches. I give wherever there is an opportunity. I practice my giving here in the sanctuary, but I live it out in the world. Right? I practice in here, but I live it out in the world. So I don't just become a giver on a Sunday between 11 and 12 or 3 o'clock whenever we get out, depending on how long I talk, right? But we become givers based upon what I do when I'm least. Right? So we're practicing being givers. It becomes a part of my lifestyle. Spiritual discipline. All right. Uh, at this time, let's rest to our feet. If you have gifts at this time, we want to encourage you to come at this time from where you are and you just sow it in the basket at this time. All right, Alondra, go ahead and get a microphone. Wake her up, please. Alondra, get a mic. She done had a good nap. You get sleepy when you're hungry, right? Alondra, go ahead and get a microphone. Not the one that looks green, the one that has a different color so it don't look like food. Go ahead, Alondra, and go ahead and start singing a song. Alondra, sing the one that you sung at the cabaret. Sing that one. Get the mic, get the mic, Ron. Say bless, 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 bless. Everybody say bless, 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 bless. to our feet as we get ready to go. We certainly appreciate and honor our visitors that are with us today. We honor your presence. We pray that there was something that was said and done to honor 
you and to lift you up and encourage you. Come on, let's lift our hands because that's where our help comes from. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this season. God, may we be mindful that some things, when we're dealing with the enemy, dealing with opposition, dealing with challenges, that some things only come by way of prayer and fasting. I cannot enter into life's challenges off a gut instinct. I have to go with the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray that as we continue to fast and to consecrate ourselves and to pray and to get into your word, that you will release and unleash your power in our life. And we know that as we continue to do this, that God, you will speak from heaven and that ultimately you will bless us. Everybody say bless, 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 Come on, everybody say bless, 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 it's, it's going, going to work, work in your, your favor. favor. Come on, let's get ready to go. Everybody say late, late, late in the midnight, midnight hour. God's, God's going, going to turn, turn around. around and 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 around I'm living in the old hey. Come on, Corey. I'm living in the overflow. I'm living in the overflow. Come on, say. I'm living in the overflow. I'm living in the overflow. Everybody say. I'm living in the overflow. I'm living in the overflow. Come on. I'm living in the overflow. 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 Have a great day. God bless you.